Welcome to At Your Library. I'm Clayton Cheever, Assistant Director at the Thomas Crane Public Library. Please join me for a look at some of the free events our library is offering this July. While our buildings remain closed during this coronavirus pandemic, we're still working hard to inspire curiosity, spark imagination, foster community, and connect people to the online world. I'm quite pleased to announce that anyone with a library card can now request and pick up library materials at our main location here at 40 Washington Street in Quincy Center. We're calling this new service our TCPL to go service. You can place holds in the online catalog, complete an online request form, or simply call the library and request materials. At this time, only items from our own collections are available to borrow as the delivery service that connects us with other libraries around the state is still suspended. Outside pickup is available by appointment only outside the Washington Street entrance to the library from Monday to Thursday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. and Friday and Saturday from 10 to 4. To keep everybody safe, there's still no public access of our buildings or any other physical services, but we continue to provide a wide range of online services and programs, including digital books, magazines, audiobooks, movies, TV shows, and music, and a full summer of virtual programs for kids, families, and adults. For more information about tcpl to go please visit thomascranelibrary.org or just give us a call at 617-376-1300, extension 2. When you have borrowed items that you're ready to return, you can drop them off at any of our locations at any time of the day and night. Each of our branches have outside book drops and the main library has a special new book drop just for media items like DVDs and CDs. Do you know which branch is closest to you? In addition to the main library here in Quincy Center, we also have locations in Wollaston, North Quincy, and Adam Shore. Please don't feel pressure to return items immediately. We have extended the due dates for all items checked out before we closed in March until at least Friday, July 31st, and you will not be charged any overdue fines. As a matter of fact, we're launching a pilot program and eliminating overdue fines on all of our materials through at least June of next summer. For many years, we've had summer and winter holiday amnesty programs that forgave overdue fines. For the past year, we've also had not had any fines on materials for children and teens. This is part of a growing movement to eliminate barriers to library services. Items will still have due dates, but we will automatically extend these a couple of times as long as no one else has requested use of the title you've borrowed. We're not offering limitless renewals, however. We do still want you to return your items when you're done with them. We'll send reminders, and if an item stays out too long, we'll just simply send a bill so we can purchase replacements to continue sharing. Borrowing privileges will be suspended if bills pile up, but all you need to do to get back in good standing is return what you've borrowed pretty simple. I hope you're as excited as I am to see overdue fines fall into the dustbin. Now, if you didn't catch everything I just said, you need help getting a virtual library card so you can access our online services. You need to reset your PIN, or maybe you'd just like someone to talk you through using our digital content, direct you to local community resources, or anything else, we are making ourselves available to help. You can use our online chat at thomascranelibrary.org slash chat, C-H-A-T, or call us at 617-376-1300, extension 3, to get help from Monday to Thursday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., on Friday from 10 to 4, and on Saturday from 10 to 1 in the afternoon. If those times aren't convenient for you, I encourage you to just send us an email at quref at ocln.org, or use the Ask a Librarian form at thomascranelibrary.org slash got hyphen questions. So it's thomascranelibrary.org slash got questions, the hyphen there between the got and the questions. You can also call us at 617-376-1300 extension three and leave us a message with callback information. It's also quite likely you'll be able to find the answer to your questions on our frequently asked questions page, which you can find at thomascranelibrary.org slash FAQS. Although we're now offering contactless pickup at the main library, we still have plenty of entertaining and educational options for those of us who aren't yet comfortable leaving our homes. 
Our updated TCPL at home page has the links you need to get content fast and includes both library sponsored resources and great online entertainment and educational opportunities that we recommend. Let me tell you quickly about some of the free online resources you can access now just with your library card, barcode number, and your PIN. You can get popular fiction and nonfiction for all ages in both ebook and audiobook formats, and you can find these on Overdrive and its sister app, Libby. With these services, you can borrow up to 10 titles at a time, and you have 14 days to listen or read to each item. A statewide library sharing agreement also makes it possible to borrow ebooks from the Overdrive collections of every Massachusetts library network, not just that of the old Colony Library Network, which we here at Thomas Crane are a member of. Please contact us if you'd like help expanding your reach into these other statewide collections. Hoopla, which can be used on a computer or on the free app, has thousands and thousands of ebooks, audiobooks, music, movies, television episodes, and comics. Quincy residents can borrow seven titles every calendar month. Fans of documentaries, international and independent films, and educational videos will love Canopy, our streaming video service. Quincy residents can check out seven videos every month. Watching Canopy for kids videos doesn't even count against your seven credits, and when you watch select series, including all of the great courses, one borrow gets you access to an entire course's worth of multiple videos. Now, more than ever, keeping up with the news is vital. Residents of Quincy can access the New York Times, the Patriot Ledger, the Boston Herald, and many more area newspapers online. More than 3,000 magazines are always available on RB Digital, including lifestyle, sports, and entertainment titles. You really should check it out if you haven't used it. It's a great way to read magazines. The last thing I want to tell you about uh, that you can get from home is how you can research your next purchase with Consumer Reports, how you can find your next great read on Novelist Plus, and discover your family tree on Heritage Quest. All these databases and more can be used from home, all for free. Remember to check out our TCPL at home page the next time you're looking for some good free education or entertainment. In these challenging times, while we're all learning all the things we can do from the safety of our homes, it's important to remember that we, as a collective human species, have been through many, many challenges over the centuries. And so far, we have always found a way to endure. We can gain great strength from studying history, and this is a time when it is especially important to share our stories so that people in the future can benefit from our own experiences. I'm confident that a very long time from now, Quincy residents, scholars, and researchers will be interested in our everyday life during the COVID-19 pandemic. You have an opportunity, and I dare say even a responsibility, to be a part of Quincy history by submitting photos, videos, journal entries, art, music, and audio messages to the Quincy COVID Memories Project. The library, along with the City of Quincy, Quincy 400, and Quincy Access Television, are collaborating to collect these moments in time from our neighbors and archive these documents. Submit your documents as many times as you'd like throughout the pandemic at quincyculturalmemory.com slash contribution. For more information, you can read our blog posts and you can watch this short video. The year 2020 will certainly be a memorable one for better or worse. While it seems the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the world to a standstill, life does go on. Whether you're working from home, trying to buy groceries, or keeping the kids entertained, life in Quincy continues, just in a different fashion. As life continues, it needs to be documented. In order to document and preserve life during the pandemic, the City of Quincy, the Thomas Crane Public Library, Quincy 400, and Quincy Access Television have partnered to form Quincy COVID Memories, a project to gather, document, and share stories and experiences of people living everyday life during the pandemic. We're asking you to share stories, photos, videos, and more that best represent your experiences during this unprecedented time. Your submission can be simple, but say a lot. Like this photo of a husband, a frontline worker, leaving for work at 5.30 a.m. Asked if he might step back during the time, he rejected the idea and said, someone's got to do it. Or this photo of a family out for a walk, just with added protection of face masks. 
or this video of a family celebrating the 89th birthday of a loved one. These submissions tell the story of life during the pandemic. Help add to the story with your daily life. Visit www.quincyculturalmemory.com to submit your story today. We're working hard to bring great programs to you every week. I hope you'll take time between noon and one on Tuesdays and join us on Twitter for a TCPL book chat. Each week, we're focusing on a different genre so you can branch out or not. To participate, just make sure to add hashtag TCPL book chat to your tweets and follow along in the conversation. We're also participating in hashtag ask a librarian on Twitter. Are you running out of stuff to read and you don't know what to pick up or download next? Get advice from librarians around the globe, including your very own dear folks here at the Thomas Crane, every Thursday from 12 to 1 in the afternoon. Just use the hashtag Ask a Librarian, tell us what you'd like to read, and watch the suggestions roll in. Earlier in this program, I talked about the Quincy COVID Memory Project. I hope you're interested and will share your photos, videos, and words. Speaking of sharing photos, we were recently approached by a Quincy College professor who, incidentally, has lived on Houseneck as well for several decades. Ron Goodman asked me if he could help share some of his expertise with our community, and I'm really pleased to announce a series of four programs that we're offering on consecutive Tuesday evenings, starting on July 14th, that we're calling Phone Photography 101. I recently recorded the following conversation with Ron about this series. I'm joined today by the fabulous uh, Ron Goodman, um, who is going to talk to me about Photography 101, how to get the most out of the camera on your smartphone. Ron, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to the series. Good, good. It should be fun. How long have you been snapping pictures? You're a major shutter bug, I take it. 70 years. 70 years? I didn't need to make you date yourself like that. <laughs> it is, yeah? Where it was I, I, must have, I, I must have started uh, when I was about 7 to 10 years old. 70 years ago, we did not have smartphones. I, I think all the phones there were probably in the kitchen, and you were lucky if you had a long enough tether so you could get away from the stove. Yeah. Um, so you started in the dark room and dealing started, with that? I started in the, in the dark room, obviously, and uh, it's now, I guess, you know, it's longer than I thought. It's probably 15, 20 years now mm -hmm. of transitioning over to digital photography. Mm -hmm. And now uh, digital photography has not only uh, uh, obviated the, uh, the, the old film, but now what's happening with the smartphones is that all the manufacturers of middle range and the smaller cameras are stopping to make them. Olympus went out of business two days ago. Wow, I didn't catch that news. Yeah, it's been a tremendous uh, change over to the uh, smartphone. Yeah. So that it's the camera that people have with them. And the manufacturers now are trying to figure out what to do, some of them, just to stay in business. Yeah. Well, there's obviously the passing of an era, which we can lament, but we can also jump into and embrace the future. There's a reason the companies are struggling. And it's not because people aren't taking pictures. People are taking no, more pictures than that. Tremendous numbers of pictures, but you don't need to carry around with you and you know a two, three pound camera. And uh, there are obviously there are tremendous limitations still with the iPhone, but um, the biggest switch that's been happening is it's that photography is no longer dependent not only on film, but also that much on the lens. Right. So when you look at a at a smart you know at a smartphone, your 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 lens is this tiny little thing in here. So what it's uh, been doing, what's been happening, is it's the algorithm, it's the software that is actually now producing the images. So it's not just what gets captured when I shutter. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and that's how you have these tiny, tiny little. Little, um, little lenses, yeah. but extraordinarily sophisticated um, computer algorithms that are... Do these even have shutters on them? Or are they pretty much always open? No, they have shutters on them. They do have shutters. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. 
But you, I mean, I don't. I've never seen in the settings on my phone. But maybe this is I haven't. No, done. you can't. You don't change. You don't okay, change the the, the 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 iPhone automat. I say the iPhone. I have to get away from that because I think we're going to have people, and I'll be prepared to use both Android and iOS, both um, uh, operating yeah. systems. Um, but um, the lens itself uh, and the opening, as it were, changes according to the algorithms. You can perhaps use some manual override with some programs. We'll go into that. Mm -hmm. And the sensitivity, what used to be known as the, uh, the ASA, automatically changes. So that it gives you oh, uh, an optimum image no matter what you do most of the time. The only limitation, the big limitation, is right now on having an optical zoom. Uh, right now you get a wide angle and a normal lens and even a slight portrait, but it's that extensive zoom that you have with a much bigger camera. But for 80% of your pictures, you don't have to have that. Hmm. So do you, I've certainly seen people who've played with adding lenses onto their cameras yeah. too, all sorts of additions. Is that something you've played with? I've played with it. I don't think that the quality yet is, uh, or the convenience yeah. is up to what uh, you'd want to have. And they're expensive. They're sometimes as much as $100 for each additional little lens. I haven't, I haven't used any extensively yet. Yeah. But I suppose that that would be uh, an option. I mean, when I remember, so I, I used to play a little bit, you know, with, with a, you know, an SLR or two, and I remember the big difference when I first got a polarizing filter and how awesome it was to do that. Um, and I assume it's just algorithms now that can handle and do all the polarizing and take out the glare, and they've really learned how to do well, that. Well, yeah, and, you, and, and one of the, some of, that's what we're going to cover extensively in this course, is how to use all of these options. Um, the, the HDR, as it's called, the high definition, where the camera will actually take five pictures, five images of one thing, and put it all together for one image. And most of the software for both um, Android and iOS smartphone cameras will do that now. So it's very difficult to get a bad picture. You can take pictures almost in, in, in dark night. I'll show you how to do that. It's amazing. Uh, which That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the tricks, and I'm glad I know that you're going to cover this in the in, in these series, is that now that everybody can take a photograph, I know I have friends that are professional photographers who are like, now everybody thinks they're a photographer. Um, and part of what I know you're going to do is also help people understand that while we all can take, you know, we, we can capture anything, there's still a skill about framing, there's what makes Absol absolutely a snapshot versus a photograph. I, mean, I think someone said recently, that, I mean, maybe there's five, like half a billion pictures taken every day. And very few of them are that good. It's the monkeys being able to constantly sit at a typewriter. Uh, they all have typewriters, but they're not necessarily going to produce a narrative. And um, I think that it's important to learn what does make a good photograph, how to take that photograph, share that with people, and also get it printed and framed uh, if, if you want to do that. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a part of that process and just knowing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that, that process has never changed. Right. What makes good art, what makes a good photograph, how you can improve your photographs how you do a portrait without everybody still having that Kodak smile. You know, just, right. And those are the things that we do want to cover in this. And I know you're also going to cover when it's okay to break the rules. Uh, so you can't break the rules unless you know what they are, but there are times when it's important to stop. Uh, always, always. Yeah. That's why people pitch underhand sometimes. <laughs> So who do you think will get the most out of this course? Uh, definitely it's going to be ready for people who are beginners um, or who have not done a lot, but a lot of us have taken a lot of pictures. So, you know, is it for somebody who's taking 20 pictures a day? Who, who um, that's, a, that's a good question. I've given a course similar to this for adults, actually at the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement, where you get a tremendous range 
of people. And uh, people, beginners uh, come, but also people who are not that familiar with all of the editing applications, all the apps that are out there. And I think the way that we can do this is to present the material in a limited period of time. And then with the chat options, to have people ask questions, and obviously they'll be from different levels. Um, but um, I, I think this will apply to most people, uh, a good range of people. Great, I think that's really exciting. And I know that while it would be great if everybody can join us for all four classes that we're gonna do, yeah. it is gonna be possible to jump in if you miss the first class to come to the second or to come to the third. Well, I think the, the last one, we really hope that will be people who've benefited from at least some of what's been shared before because, and there'll be some original new content in the last class, but there's also gonna be an opportunity to do some sharing, taking what you've learned and then, then talking about it amongst everybody else. It'd be kind of weird to yeah. just join that one, but I'm sure you could do that because you could, you probably just wouldn't have anything to share for, that would be benefiting from what you learned already. Yeah, and I think that with your help as we arrange this, that these modules can stand alone um, for, you know, going through the mechanics and, and how in the, and the cameras itself in these, and then what makes a good picture, a good photograph could stand on its own. And especially the post-production where we take a look at some, they're coming out weekly and most of them are free, uh, for these apps that can just transform your pictures into all kinds of, uh, uh, different images, that would be standalone. And then uh, finally also, what to do with the images once you get them? How do you share them with people? How do you archive them? Can you make a little book? That's another thing I think we will, we will touch on um, at the end also is, um, I think we'll have time of, of making some of these um, books that people put together. You can do that now very inexpensively and very easily. And it frees us from having to do everything on these screens, which have tied us together so much. But, yeah. you know, I know that I've given those books as gifts to people before. So you've done this, yeah. And I think that's a great thing to do, especially when you can't be together. And as our travel is seriously limited, to be able to send a photo book to people of a family members who are you yeah, know, getting and older. And share that book. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll do that. That will be one of the modules. So I think that they all could, as you've suggested yourself, um, if not stand on their own, you can come in at different times. It's obviously going to be richer if you can experience the whole thing, but you will be able to just come in and sample if you're not able to join us for everything. So I'm Absolutely. really glad that we're structuring it that way. Um, yeah. I think this is gonna be a great, great experience. We're gonna do a, four, a total of four classes to start. Uh, we'll explore possibilities and then see where people are. We're gonna do it here on Zoom, which is what we're using to record our conversation right now. Um, but we will also live stream uh, so if people have an easier time watching, I know sometimes Zoom is challenging for some folks. So we'll be live streaming on Facebook and on YouTube um, so people can ask questions by chat on those platforms and engage. We'll also be using... I leave that up to, I leave that up to you and... Uh... That's what we've been doing and it works pretty smoothly. One of the nice things if you want to watch like with a family, I know in my family we have a little Roku stick that we stick into the TV. Um, you can't project Zoom very easily or Facebook but I can put YouTube and we can all watch something and even participate, maybe use your phone for the chat, but you're watching it. There's all sorts of ways. We want to make it so wherever people are, you, they can get to you and also be able to archive. So if you miss the first one or something, you can go back and watch it. Although you won't be able to ask questions afterwards. Um, yeah. We can share emails and such, obviously, but it won't be the same. It's going to be richest to be there in person virtually. So good. Great. Thank you, Ron. I'm really looking forward to it. I really I appreciate too. you reaching out. I know you're a proud Quincy resident, and, uh, and, and it's just great that you're, uh, you know, you've reached out and are figuring out a way to give back to the community. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Another pair of programs I'm really excited to tell you about uh, is we are reuniting with Sean Murphy to learn more about Irish history on Monday, July 20th, and again on August 3rd. Learn more about what's sure to be a great couple of programs made possible by the support of the Friends of the Library. I just recently recorded this conversation I had with Sean. I'm joined today by Sean Murphy, who's going to talk with me about two very exciting uh, programs we have coming up. Uh, the first program that Sean and I are going to talk about uh, is all about 
Irish women and the role that women have played in Irish society over the ages. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to work again with you. We've had a couple of great programs already uh, in these really unsettling times, and I'm really excited to be working together again for these. So, yeah. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm looking forward to doing these. Uh, these couple keeps my brain ticking over, and uh, every time I go through them, it's it's wonderful to you know to be able to recognize uh, your history and to give recognition to the people who came before you and to uh, help other people to understand uh, our long and varied uh, and exciting history. Well, it is quite a history, and I uh, I think both of these uh, stories. Have got you know the, the story of Ireland has so many lessons that resonate you know over the ages and can be especially meaningful for us as we're living today. You know I think a lot of times when history is taught right, it gives us so many lessons to help us learn you know how to live today. And and the first program we're going to do is all about Irish women and the role uh, you know the, the rights and role that women have played in Irish society over the ages. Um, which I found quite fascinating. I was not, uh, you know, I had some inkling, but until I was reading even some of the description, I'm really excited about your course because it, it, it became very clear that women once held a very high role for many, many, you know, hundreds of years, it seems, uh, in Ireland. So uh, right. tell us a little bit. How did you, um, how did you first discover that, uh, the, the strong role that women had had in Irish history? Okay. Well, I mean, it was a it was a strong role that women had for thousands of years, not hundreds of years. Um, we we know very little, uh, you know, about uh, about the role of women up to about five or you know, around five thousand years ago. Um, before that, there were people. There were people in Ireland after the last ice age, which goes back about twelve twelve thousand years ago. Um, but um, five six thousand years ago, uh, the, the first case we have and it demonstrates the legal powers that women had um, and uh, that would be my starting point on the course because this demonstrates that uh, and, and also uh, it was one in which the uh, the judges at, at the time uh, decided in favour of a woman and it was a case she took against her husband who was the King of Ireland uh, who had uh, killed her dog in a fit of rage, jealous rage uh, and, and she won uh, she won that. Uh, there's Ireland's always referred to uh, in the feminine. It's always referred to as a woman, and uh, most of the names for Ireland uh, refer to women queens. Uh, you know, there's Scotia, which is the origin of Scotland, in fact, and people from Ireland for a long time, even in the time of Julius Caesar, were called Scotties. Um, reputedly after Scotia. And then there was Fan, uh, there was Fola, Banba, and um, Fola, Banba, and an, another woman. Uh, they were three names for Ireland, uh, you know, originally. Uh, and again, they were all women. The only one that was uh, male was uh, uh, a son of the king of Miles, uh, of King Miles, who was the last of the Celtic invaders to Ireland, and his name was Ear. You know, so Ireland, Ear land, the land of Ear. Uh, Era, which is the Irish name, uh, is the other one. I said Fanban and Fola. The other one was Eru. So she's the one that Aaron comes from, and uh, Era, which was which is the Irish word for uh, for Ireland. And then we have probably everyone's heard of Queen Maeve. Um, Bridget and the connection between Bridget and the goddess Bridget uh, is is important, um, and also the uh, the in the formal uh, when it when the, when the monarch of Ireland because we had a monarchy in Ireland for a long time, uh, and when the monarch got married, sorry, uh, was was uh, was was uh, was enthroned, uh, it was seen in all Irish history as the marriage. And he was getting married to the goddess of sovereignty. Uh, and again, that was personified by a woman. And one of the reasons why women weren't sole monarchs or the women could be queens of provinces and queens, you know, and, and head of their clans, but they couldn't be the monarch of Ireland. And the reason was because uh, uh, same sex marriage was not recognized. There were 10 types of unions recognized in ancient Ireland. 
Three of them were, if you like, formal marriages, and the other seven were different types of unions. But they were all recognized because within all of those unions, there were rights, responsibilities, and things that had to be, you know, clarified for the purposes of society and the law. Uh, but none of those included same sex marriage. So it didn't make sense in old Irish society then for a man to marry a woman in the sense that he was marrying the goddess of sovereignty. So that's one explanation that we have for why. And in fact, there was only one. There was one, one queen monarch of Ireland, uh, and she had to take it to the battlefield uh, to essentially assert her rights. She claimed that she uh, had, had the right to be the, uh, the monarch of Ireland because when her father died, he had no sons. So it's often a claim. And within all our Gaelic society, if uh, there were traditions around what happens, if uh, the, uh, parent, if the father dies or the man dies without a male heir, uh, usually his property went to his daughters. Now, when they died, the property had to come back to the clan because in, in ancient Ireland, the property couldn't be alienated is what the word they used. So it couldn't end up in the hands of a different clan. But anyway, that's... So, the, so there's the, obviously quite a rich history, which I'm really excited. And there's a lot that you obviously know and, and, and will learn about. But I also so understand that things radically changed in Ireland when Christianity came in, uh, was, was forced upon. And that really radically changed the role that women were allowed to play in society. That's right. The, uh, so a lot of the rights that women had uh, were changed. And in fact, even the laws, because when the laws were written down for the first time, it was written down during the time of St. Patrick. Uh, and anything that did not uh, gel with Christianity was kind of left aside. And unfortunately, we don't have the side notes of those meetings. So we don't actually know a lot about. Uh, we, we know there was a continuity in, in lots of areas, but we don't know the pieces that were, were ditched. All we do know is that the the old laws of Ireland were Christianized. And we take St. Bridget, <clears throat> you know, again, there were, there were issues because even in, in, in the kind of transition period, it was getting more difficult for women, you know, to be leaders within their society. And it was a, a nephew of St. Patrick who essentially gave St. Bridget her start. Uh, and, and, and Bridget was a slave to begin with. And her mother was a slave. Her mother came from Portugal. Um, had she, she had been brought, you know, to, to, to Ireland as a slave. So, uh, but you could in, in, in Ireland, it wasn't like a case system in India. You could work yourself up to, you know, from a slave up to the top, literally. Or you could work yourself down. You could end up being a slave. If you can't get to the point where you couldn't pay your debts or you committed a crime and no one forgave you, if you like, you ended up uh, back there. But she, uh, she relied upon a, a man. So she, she, she managed to, to, to make her, uh, you know, her stay. Now, the, the next big change then came when England came to Ireland because English common law made women the property of their husbands. And that was totally different. And it wasn't just you that were the property, your kids were their property. Uh, under ancient society, when you went into a marriage, whatever you brought in, you kept and you had a right to it during your marriage and you had a right to it when you left because there was a divorce. But under English law, everything that you had once you came into the marriage was your husband's, including, as I said, your, your children. And if you left, you left without any of them. You left without your kids. I mean, that, that was her That's a yeah, what a what a terrifying, what a what a radical transition. Yeah. And then we know that during the, the, the fight for independence, women were some of the very were serious leaders. Um right. and that there's a great credit for the reclamation of women's rights because of that the inspiration both from the ancient history and from the more recent freedom fighters. Um, that's, right. that's right. Women participated in uh, you know the rebellions uh, uh, from as far back as 1798, and um, the uh, and just going back a little bit further, Grace O'Malley often talked about as Grand New Whale, uh, who was known as the Pirate uh, Queen in the you know in the 15 in the late 1500s when Queen Elizabeth was around. Uh, she was recognised as a leader of her clan. Um, and that's about as far as the recognition went. But then when we, when we got to the, uh, after the famine, there was a whole sea change uh, in Ireland. If it had never been clear, you know, to people, it became immediately clear that our, our, our problem is twofold. One is the fact that our country is owned by, by another country. 
and also that the people that they put into this country do not have our interests. So that was bad enough. But the problem after the famine was emigration. You know, uh, you know, the population, there was something like 3 million people left Ireland from the beginning of the famine up to 1920. You know, so the, the drain was destroying the country. Uh, also, uh, our, you know, our language was dying. Um, and then the second wave then, you know, came in the, 80, early, the early 1880s uh, when with the, with the changes that were brought in, you now had uh, the only people who could stay in Ireland really were the eldest son and the eldest daughter. So all the non-inheriting daughters and non-inheriting sons had to leave. So that was, a, a, you know, a huge, you know, uh, uh, you know, draw people out of the country, most of which came to America. And that was the common thing, because uh, most of the people who arrived in this country came as families. But, uh, you know, for a lot, a lot of the time from the 1850s onwards, it was just sole, you know, individuals, men and women, which again was unusual, that single so all women, you know, would come. Uh, so by then, uh, people had begun to understand we need to do something. And the process was called de-anglicization. The idea was to, first of all, to, to recover some sense of dignity and respect for who we are as a people and uh, to get people to understand the deep heritage. Because the one thing that they understood that people need if they were going to deal with that situation was motivation. And the motivation had to come from being the person that you were and from your connection with your past. So they started to work. So the cultural kind of revolution, if you like, had begun in the 1880s. A lot of that was led by women. Uh, and in fact, in the land war, uh, which was in the 1870s, that was also, there was a, a two committees set up because it was clear that the England, England would use the coercion acts to arrest the male leadership. But the English were such that they had difficulty arresting women. So there was a shadow leadership set up that was made up of women that were put, up, put in place to take over when and if and really, it was a question of just when, because they did get arrested, the men got arrested. So they took over and led that. And the land war was the end of it, really, for, uh, for England, because the result of that was all of those landlords ended up being bailed out at the beginning of the 20th century. And the Irish land, which had been confiscated and taken uh, over the previous 700 years, was then returned to Irish uh, people. And women played a great role in that. In 1916, the same thing, the, the, uh, the, the, the opening words you know, to the proclamation included women. And the commitment that was in it was to women and, and the children of the land. Then during the War of Independence, uh, women played a critical role as well. Uh, there, there was an ongoing debate because, uh, you know, within the women's movement because there were issues like, you know, uh, because suffrage was kind of uh, one of the main issues that women were fighting for at the time. So the issue for a lot of women is what's, which comes first? Does the fight for suffrage become uh, the main pr primary battle or is the fight for national independence? Do we need to get national independence before we can get suffrage? And then can we get both at the same time? You know, so there were people, unfortunately, women were split. And then, of course, in Ireland as well, because even though the country was still not uh, partitioned, the reality was women north and south of Ireland and women in Ireland and women in Britain were divided because of the national uh, questions. That created some difficulties. Uh, but during the War of Independence, women did jobs that men couldn't do. You know, uh, women were able to get jobs in offices as uh, you know, clerical assistants and the rest and were able to effectively spy and get information that was very, very useful. Also, women could travel around the country, not, not, not disguised, but in ways that didn't arouse suspicion. So they could go school teachers, you know, into areas and gather lots of information. They could also bring food, you know, to uh, uh, soldier, uh, to, to, to Irish rebels who were up on the mountainside because they could basically be safe they were stopped. You know, I'm bringing this food, you know, to some of the poor families up here. I see them every day in school and they're half starving. So all of this food is going to the Murphys up here and the Quinns up here or whatever. But in reality, they were bringing it. So there were lots of jobs like that that women uh, could do. The other issue was... It does women sound... Were, I'm hmm. going to interrupt you for just a sec because I think... Um, First, I want to encourage everybody to come. There's, there's so much fascinating detail here that it is it's abundantly clear that not only have women had a very interesting history, um, they've been really integral to the 
the development and I mean of, of every society for sure. But this, there's going to be a lot. There's just so many awesome examples of what role women have played that have made Ireland what it is today. And what we're going to talk about in our second program is really celebrating the the culture. And I'm sure women have been a, a part of that celebration uh, woven through the tapestry as well. And I wonder if we can pivot a little bit um, and encourage people to to come to the second program as well. Um, and, sure. And, sure. and I think, you know, we're, we're, when I'm taking, one of the things that I'm taking the, from what you've been saying so far is just a, a great appreciation for all the creative ways that people have figured out how to survive with these very challenging circumstances. Um, and that, that women have been integral to that. Um, and, but it's that, that ability to survive with, you know, you know, with, with, with England coming in with, you know, with Kings that are killing dogs with like, you know, there's just such over thousands yeah. of years and, and, but there's, there's a way that they did it without going crazy uh, and, and by persisting and, Tell me about it. You know, you were inspired, I think, to put this, this the, our second program that we're going to celebrate uh, this summer together because of that survival instinct and, and the beauty of how Ireland and its people sure. have survived. Yeah, and it also goes, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, I, Irish people are known as hospitable uh, and friendly, and uh, and a lot of people take that, uh, you know, for granted. But the, the reality is that it's rooted, you know, in our history. The old laws uh, and customs in, in ancient Ireland, uh, hospitality was one of the key features of that. And uh, it, it was structured. And even down to the basic level, you know, everybody had to be prepared to take uh, what was called a, a stranger, you know, into the house. You got a knock on the door, you had to take them in, feed them, look after them, uh, have them entertained. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, promoting uh, the best, you know, of, of, of Ireland. So that was, that, the hospitality was a central feature and there were laws which governed it. Um, so the fact that Irish people continue that is connected to that distant past. Unfortunately, during the famine, that got broken for the first time because during the famine time, when people were dying and diseased, they had to turn people away. Uh, and also uh, what people used to do was... Uh, uh, you know, to indicate that you shouldn't come near them. They had to put, uh, there was a certain type of uh, bush that they had to put or, or some indication outside of the house. Please, you know, please don't come here. But the tradition of that hospitality began to be broken at, at that stage. Uh, but still, you know, you know, people, Irish people dance and sing everywhere. So I put this together and it's a combination of history. So I'm trying to connect all of that to try to explain why people are what they are. I also want to show the art that people produced, particularly during the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age started in Ireland about you know, 2500 uh, BC, you know, 4,500 years ago. And uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, that the artwork there is as good as the artwork that anybody could do today. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, we also think uh, there are some people who argue that uh, King Solomon's gold came from Ireland because there was so much gold, you know, in Ireland at this at this time. And it's, uh, it's also possible that the Irish were involved about 1200 BC. Uh, there were mines uh, on the on the East Coast here, uh, copper mines that essentially were emptied uh, by people from Europe. Um, we think that maybe some of those may have originated from Ireland or Ireland was a staging post, you know, in that. So there's some amazing history there. But I'm going to give you some examples, particularly what's, what kids are doing today. Their dancing is just wonderful. Um, and there's a whole new uh, focus in terms of dancing. And uh, they're, they're creative. Uh, I'll be showing you how they use their dance to show off the countryside the area so for instance you have kids dancing on mountain mountaintops you know so that you can see the beautiful scenery and also on the beaches there's uh, and uh you know i have a little bit of comedy the problem with comedy is that it's so hard to get a family comedian um and it's very <laughs> hard to uh, uh, to get any more than about 10 seconds of a comedian without something being said that's offensive but i have brendan grace who died last year and he was he's the kind of the main family comedian. So I've got some, some, some of his work. Uh, so I've got the, 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 the art, the songs, uh, the music, uh, the history to kind of tie it all together. 
And, uh, and you're going to be sharing a lot of, uh, I, I assume, a lot of video with this, mm, in addition right. to stills of some of the, the ancient art. That's right. So I, people I, can I, expect I, a very, uh, mm. yeah, it'll be a very multimedia presentation. That's right. There won't be that much of me talking. Um, you know, there'll be uh, plenty, plenty of embedded uh, video. I'll also then, when I'm there, be letting you know about my ongoing courses. Uh, I teach um, uh, a, a course of general history that starts at the very beginning uh, in terms of Ireland, which is 1.7 billion years ago, and I bring that right up to the present day. I also do uh, a history of each county of Ireland, and then I'm working on some new material now as well. One of the ones I'd like to do in the next year or two is the history of the Irish and American. Well, I'm, I'm sure that would be a fascinating program that I would certainly love to learn more about. So, Sean, I am so grateful. You have such a great wealth of knowledge about Ireland and the Irish diaspora, really, uh, because it's a lot more than just the Emerald Isle. The, the people of Ireland have gone on to influence culture on a global scale um, and to inspire us, all of us, with whatever, wherever we all come from, we can all learn something from this history of uh, a really amazing place. So I appreciate you sharing your passion and your knowledge with us. Sure. Uh, I, can't, I really look forward to these programs and yeah. to more in the future. Thank you it's so because, much. Because one of the things that, uh, you know, would be very, very paralleled with here is the history of the native peoples of this country. Mm. Because obviously the, the European history in this country is only hundreds of years old. Uh, whereas, you know, if we're talking about five to 10 year, 10,000 years, you know, it's, it's really the native peoples of this country that sh would share some and would understand, you know, some of the old and ancient history of Ireland more than Europeans. That makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, I am looking forward to doing it. Great. Okay. I am as well. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I look Thanks. forward to seeing you there. Okay. See you soon. Great. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. These programs will take place via Zoom and be shared across our YouTube and Facebook pages to make it as easy as possible for you to participate. We'll be archiving them for future viewing on YouTube, where you can already view the last two classes that Sean taught for us, which are Irish History 101 and the impact of Brexit on Ireland. The last adult program in July that I want to tell you about is another in our series of Cooking with Colin, and it's once again co-sponsored by the Boston Vegetarian Society. On Thursday, July 23rd, Colin will be teaching us some delicious recipes for veggie burgers and veggie sausages. I recently spoke with Colin and recorded it so I could share it with you. So I'm talking today with Colin McCullough, who is going to be doing a fabulous program for us this month, all about veggie burgers and sausages. So thanks for joining me today, Colin. It's great to see you. Yeah, good to see you again. We're here in the heat of summer. And uh, it's just a great time to be cooking outdoors. So while we've done some programs with you recently where we were enjoying smoothies and sauces and, and awesome desserts, you know, nothing really says summer like having, you know, firing up the grill and doing some cooking on it. And one of the great things about veggie burgers and veggie sausages is that everybody can enjoy them. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of people who, who may want to learn how to cook these who, you know, it's really easy to throw a hunk of, of meat on a grill I, if that's something that you're okay with, but it's, uh, you know, they may be just confused or not know what to do with their, their you know, they're just going to throw a carrot on the grill. What are they doing? So how, when did you start making veggie burgers? How Let's long see. have you been doing this? Well, uh, I've been vegan for 25 years and, you know, I kind of started out buying the Boca burgers and the stuff at the store. And, uh, you know, I like that stuff. You know, if I come to a cookout and they have it, then I'm happy to eat that. But, you know, I, I do try to eat uh, sort of less processed uh, if I can. And, uh, you know, so, you know, in the recipes that I've developed and, you know, in the cookbook that I wrote, um, I have a lot of different recipes for different veggie burgers. But, um, you know, I'm really not trying to copy, you know, like the Boca Burger or like the Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, people know that. Uh, so, you know, these are, are kind of more, um, you know, whole grain and bean uh, recipes that, you know, you put it in the food processor and then make patties out of it. And, you know, that would be something that you could, you know, bring to any uh, potluck, I mean, any uh, barbecue or, uh, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll just uh, make a batch and put them in the freezer and then just have them on hand whenever I want that. So, um so, you know, there's different uh, recipes for veggie burgers. 
Um, you know, you can use all kinds of different combinations and we'll go over all of that in the class, but uh, that, and also I have different recipes for uh, veggie sausages. Uh, so I'm really excited to learn, to learn about those. I've made a few, uh, I've done some seitan sausages before. Do you use a lot of Greek gluten as your base or I have uh, seen actual carrot dogs too, where people literally it looks like they base the carrot <laughs> and then do it. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I've heard people really like that, but I like something a little bit more, I think, uh, crafted. Yeah, I suppose the carrots, uh, you know, if you put a lot of, uh, you know, mustard and ketchup and relish all over it, then it probably wouldn't even matter that much, but. It's all about the fixings for most of my, fi whenever I eat it, you know, I, I haven't always been vegan, although I've been vegan myself for quite a long time, as you know, um, but it's always been about the fixings. I'm always about good fixings, but a good sausage is also like, just so the good mustard on top of it is awesome. So what do you use as the base yeah. for a lot of your sausages? Um, it's, um, it's weak gluten, but it's kind of a, a mix of different things. So a lot, a lot of the times I'll use, uh, tofu in combination with weak gluten. So weak gluten, if you make sausages out of that, it tends to be really dense. Um, and, uh, so if you cut it with, uh, tofu and, you know, weak gluten is, is kind of a processed ingredient. So I, I'm trying to use more, uh, whole food ingredients and, and kind of cut down on that. So, uh, you know, as it actually, if you use tofu, then it just makes a much better uh, consistency, um, much chewier texture. It's really nice. And I'm sure like the, uh, the mousse that you were showing us, when you put tofu in a sausage, I bet you most people who don't have much experience with tofu and swear they don't like tofu at all, wouldn't <laughs> even know that that's what they were eating. That's Is right. That true, yeah. you think, have you ever, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you cut it open, there's not like chunks of tofu in there. So, you, you know, know, it doesn't look like the bottom of it. your miso soup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's really just kind of uh, healthy alternatives to, you know, what, what we're used to putting on the grill. We healthy and, and welcoming for everybody. They're really tasty and they're something that everybody can enjoy. So if you have maybe some vegetarians come into your cookout or you just have people who like to eat healthy, there's lots of reasons people might enjoy mm -hmm. these recipes. So yeah. I know that sometimes... Um, and I'm sure you'll talk about this in the class, but you know, it's, it's sometimes when you're cooking with vegetables on a grill, they don't always hold together as well. Uh, so I don't know if you have any tips if people are cooking before, if they watch this and just go, go inspired to go do it on their own. One of the things that I know I've noticed is sometimes even like the, oh, the Prager burgers or some of the other ones, they fall apart a little bit. You need to be a little more delicate uh, in your yeah. grill technique. But. Yeah. Well, um, you know, a lot of the veggie burgers that I like to make, the, the whole grain, whole food versions, um, uh, usually I will tell people, you know, if you're going to put it on a grill, uh, just put it on a piece of tin foil or something uh, because they're not, they're going to, they're not going to hold together as well as, uh, you know, something like an impossible burger. Like, you know, that holds together really well or like a Beyond Burger, a Boca Burger holds together really well. Uh, there's a lot of processed ingredients in there, so it kind of helps to, to bind it all together. Uh, if you're using the more natural ingredients, then it's a little more delicate, but, you know, uh, you, you can cook it on the grill on the uh, aluminum foil. You can, you know, put it in an air fryer, which is what I do a lot. You can uh, pan fry it. You can put it in an oven. So there's all kinds of different options. But, yeah, you know, it, I wouldn't uh, go throwing it around. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose if you need to throw it around, you should probably stick to portobellos or pineapple rings or, or eggplant or, or potatoes. There's lots of great vegetables that are fabulous on the grill. Yeah. Um, as long as you cut them big enough that they don't fall through, you know, fall through the grates. Uh, I, I always, every, every summer is not complete until I drop at least one potato, you know, potato <laughs> slice in between into the fire. But so right. uh, this is the joy of summer cooking. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm super excited that we'll be doing this and sharing the skills with everybody. Thank you, Colin. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great class. So we, yep. are, we should mention we are so grateful for the support of the Boston Vegetarian Society um, because we know they like to eat, eat healthy as well and, and share tips for how you can eat healthy on a plant-based diet. Um, so they're helping get the word out. Uh, and we also have great support from the friends to make this happen, uh, the friends of the library. So uh, we'll give thanks before the program starts, but it's always nice to have a little moment to give them a shout out here as well. So You bet. Great. Well, thank you, Colin. I look forward to it. We're going to have a great summer. All right. Thank you.
Are you hungry after hearing Colin and I talk about food? This summer, we weren't able to participate in some of the big group cookouts that many of us have enjoyed in past summers as we maintain physical distancing to keep each other safe and healthy. But we still have to eat, and I hope you enjoy these recipes as much as my family and I do. In addition to programs for adults, our teen librarian and all of our children's librarians are working hard to present programs for our younger friends. From Harry Potter adventures, teen karaoke, game nights, a virtual escape room, and more, I encourage all Quincy teens to check it out. It's entirely virtual and being held on Beanstack, Instagram, and Zoom. You can learn more at thomascranelibrary.org slash teen summer reading. And teen summer reading has hyphens in between. So Thomas Crane Library is all one word, but then teen hyphen summer hyphen reading is where you can find more information about the teen programs. And you can also find the reading list for high school reading. The theme for this summer's reading program is Imagine Your Story. And like previous years, we're tracking reading activities and program attendance. If you already have a Beanstack account, there's no need to create a new one. Just choose summer reading when you log in. Parents can create accounts and log in for children who are too young to do it for themselves. The challenge, our summer reading challenge, runs now through Friday, August 28th, and there will be prizes. This month, the library will host a virtual puppet show, balloon magic show, mermaid story time, Avatar The Last Airbender trivia, a Harry Potter birthday party, and more for younger kids. Watch our events calendar to find out when and where online the programs will be. Teens will want to follow the teen Instagram page, which is at teens at TCPL. So it's T-E-E-N-S-A-T-T-C-P-L. That's where the most up-to-date information and many programs will be for teens. For kids in seventh grade and younger, parents will want to visit our website, thomascranelibrary.org slash children slash summer and the Children's Room Facebook page for updates. If you're looking for recommendations of things to read, watch, and listen to, I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel where we have a playlist dedicated to staff picks. Our monthly newsletter also includes some great gems, including my personal suggestion of Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. This book just came out a couple of months ago and was on the New York Times bestseller list for a number of weeks. I'm hoping I can organize a program with the author for some time in our future, as I have a particularly close personal connection to this story. That's all for this episode of At Your Library. The best way to stay up to date on the latest library news is to visit our website at thomascranelibrary.org, sign up for our monthly email newsletter, like our Facebook pages, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Clayton Cheever. Thanks for joining me for a look at what's happening at your library this month. I hope you've enjoyed the conversations I've shared and learning more about what's going on at your library. We're working hard to bring what you need in these challenging times. I hope you'll join us online and appreciate all of our efforts. Please continue to be safe and healthy. I look forward to seeing you again in August.